my name is Fritz Hoogland. Uh, as you could hear by my pronunciation, uh, I'm from, from the Netherlands. So, uh, like she said, uh, please bear with me, English is not my first language. Um, I work for a company called Yugabyte, and um, Yugabyte is a distributed database, uh, which is a very interesting technology and actually has a great match with the cloud and with stuff like Kubernetes because we, we created it from the ground up to, to use it. And um, one of the things that I have been looking into and uh, I have been uh, talking to with a lot of clients in my role as a uh, developer advocate is on how to configure things. Um, and that is what this talk is about, is, is about Linux and uh, disk I.O. and disk I.O. performance with relation to uh, memory. And that is, is actually um, really interesting. And if you look at Postgres, uh, Postgres uh, uses I.O. in a way that memory of Linux is really important. So I think this is a talk which is really good for Postgres people to look into too. And, oh my God, what is it small? <laughs> Um, if you look at uh, cloud native applications, uh, so meaning running in the cloud, what you typically see is that running in the cloud, you try to use as small machines as possible. And with as small machines as possible, it's the lowest amount of CPUs because that's cheaper, which automatically also means you have lesser memory, which is really interesting because these machines have with it a limit on the amount of I.O. they can perform. And that is a really interesting topic, which, which I think has a really important uh, relation to this, um, to this presentation, uh, which is on one hand a bit ph philosophical, but on the other hand is really important to understand. Think about this. When I started doing database technologies, we disks were all the thing you absolutely had to look at and understand that the disk rotates at a certain speed. And because of this rotational speed, it meant it could give you um, data at a certain rate. So disks, the rotating disks were absolutely a bottleneck. And if you think about where this is going with cloud, please bear with me because I think this is really important to understand. If, if you want to understand and learn about disk I.O. performance uh, and, and cloud. So we have these rotating disks and they have a certain limit in how much bandwidth and I.O.s per second they can give you. Luckily, in the 90s came RAID set. And with RAID sets, you could use multiple disks as one logical disk, which meant that you could use more bandwidth. The latency didn't go lower, but you could use more bandwidth of the disks. Um, when that started to happen, at the same time, uh, networked apply, uh, network attached storage and storage area networks came in uh, came into place and with these you had specialized appliances running IO for you which meant that they could produce even bigger amount of IOs because they could host more disks than your server probably would have been uh, able to host and the especially sense and Nessus 2 would have had uh, caches which meant that they could actually lower latency that was all great. And then came SSDs. And SSDs were fantastic because SSDs were disks which were sitting, which didn't have any rotating things, which could sit in your own server. And in your server, they could provide you really low latency. Then came NVMe access to the disks, which meant that you could use a lot of more bandwidth, which was essentially limited to the system bus on your computer. So you had huge bandwidth and very low latency. And then came cloud. And with cloud, if you take such a small machine, and as, as I talked about earlier, that machine is automatically bound to a certain amount of IOs and a certain amount of bandwidth that you can use.
And with that, if you look at the bandwidth and the amount of IOs per second that you can do in a virtual machine, it's essentially, I see the same limits as with a disk, which I first saw in the 1990s. That's mind-blowing and weird. What does this have to do with this presentation? Well, first of all, it's important to realize that disk is actually, again, a bottleneck, especially if you use uh, smaller cloud VMs. And using smaller cloud VMs is what you probably want to do in the cloud to reduce cost. So now going back, if you're doing I.O., probably your, the I.O. you're doing is buffered. And buffered means that if you're performing an I.O., the stuff you obtain is stored in the memory of your Linux server. And if you request it again, it comes from memory. There is another option, which is called uh, direct I.O., uh, which can be set using a, a specific flag. That is possible. That will completely bypass the cache. Uh, and that has advantages that you don't store this data in two places. Because if you want to get it in user space in your application or for your database in your database cache, then it doesn't make sense to also store it in the operating system. Um, a lot of databases use a direct I.O., but Postgres doesn't use it. And Postgres even explicitly um, in still today, I'm not sure if that's going to change, asks you to set a reasonably small amount for its own cache and, uh, set and use the operating system caching. Now, if you're confused, if you have nothing to do with, an, uh, with a database, but just want to understand how your application can use uh, I.O., then, and you're not sure whether you're using direct I.O. or not, probably you're using buffered I.O. You can use uh, LSOF as a utility to just see how your open flags are, but probably you're using buffered I.O. So where does buffered I.O. go? Well, somewhere on your Linux system, obviously. Linux does not have a true dedicated cache for these blocks. Traditional Unixes like uh, IBM AEX and HPUX did have a dedicated cache, so a shielded area where this would go. Linux doesn't have that. And there is another interesting topic. If you're doing buffered I.O., which is probably most of all of your I.O., then it must be stored uh, as a cached block in your, um, in your server. Even if you're completely running low on memory, it must be stored as a cached block at one point, even if it is flushed immediately. Writes are different. Writes are special, and I will get to that. The important part is, and, and uh, because I've done Oracle for a, lot of, for a long time, and Oracle, uh, you should set direct I.O. For, for Oracle, when I started looking into buffered memory, then I realized that if you're doing buffered memory, it competes equally with applications just trying to take memory for the purpose of growing their heap for performing their work. They compete evenly, which is really interesting to think about. And I know numerous cases where people, in this case, again, Oracle, but I've done Oracle for 25 years, so I have a lot of experience and references to that. I know a lot of people doing Oracle where they very carefully crafted all their memory areas very carefully because databases are really sensitive to memory and especially shortage of memory and they would work and then all of a sudden they would find that their system had swapped which they totally didn't expect and even I for a lot of times didn't understand it but it wasn't a problem because the system wasn't actually swapping but swap was taken and now when I investigated buffered IO in hindsight, I realized what happened. The backup is done, and the backup is probably done buffered, which means it competes with 
normal applications and therefore it would push out certain pages which have a really low touch count. The Linux buffer cache keeps a touch count of all the, all the buffers and it will push out the one with the lowest touch count if you're, if you're running low on memory and uh, push these to swap. But if that is a bootstrap a page which contains your, uh, your executable code which is only used for starting up your application, this page will never be used again. So it's not a problem. So that is another point. If you're swapping out and you're not uh, actively swapping in and out and you have swapped out some stuff, it's not a problem. And I've seen a lot of tickets which people try to y lower back the swap because that was what's supposed to be how it should be. Don't, that's not necessary. Okay, so, but where does buffer go, IO go? So I haven't s said anything about it. Well, Linux provides an insight into how memory is divided in proc mem info. And messy sounds a bit negative on the slides. I say it's a messy gathering of statistics, but it's actually just a whole bunch of statistics. And some of the statistics have figures in it which are also doubled by other statistics. And some statistics aren't kilobytes, but are pages, for example, for the large, uh, for the large pages. Um, but very roughly, if you look at the statistics for cache 30 and mapped, these are roughly what is that, uh, what, what is uh, the cache of these blocks. That's not really precise, what I'm saying. I know. What I'm trying to say is, it probably is not useful and handy to try to exactly figure out how much of these pages you're caching. It, it fluctuates, also it fluctuates all the time. Um, but you have to have memory available for buffered usage. And actually the best indicator, which is very much non-set, I cannot find a lot of reference to this, but the best way to assess if you have enough memory is the statistic mem available. It's a, I've forgotten the exact Linux version, but it's mem available is, is not a really ancient uh, statistic, but mem available is what is actually potentially available at that point in time that you, queer, that you are querying proc mem info. One of the things that I get asked quite frequently is, uh, is what about mem free? Well, mem free is not free as in available. Mem free is actually a small amount of data which Linux tries to keep free for the purpose of very quickly handing out freed memory. Linux, and this is a really important rule, uh, probably like most operating system, tries to do as little as possible. So if you're dirtying, if you push in data, to, it will just be there. It will not be freed only for a bare minimum, which is mem free. So it has nothing to do with memory being available. It's a tiny part of memory which is explicitly made free for the, for the sake of providing um, uh, page memory pages to a Linux process which requires uh, free memory. Of course, just after startup, there is a lot of free memory because you haven't touched all this memory, so it's by definition actually free. But like I said, if you start doing stuff, it will just put stuff in all these buffers and it will not do anything with it unless it absolutely has to. If you actually need to make memory free, you're using the swapper and at Yugabyte we use virtual uh, machines with no swap allocated, which I had a hard feeling about it, but actually it works rather well. And what you sometimes see on a system with no swap allocated is that the swapper thread of the Linux kernel gets active, which is really weird because we don't have any swap. Well, the swapper is actually not really good naming in the Linux. In, in Linux, the swapper is actually the page daemon, and it's the swapper who frees memory if a process actually needs it. So, and I've got a link. This presentation will be made available. I've got a link who tells a lot more about it. So, mem free. It's the kernel estimation of memory that is available without requiring uh, swapping immediately. 
So why would this be important? Well, buffering I.O. can do miracles for performance. Uh, and equally, it can do miracles for application which require, which require to do I.O. And let's test this. Let's actually just see how this works. And I provide really simple command lines. Test it for yourself. If you're having doubts, do the actual good thing and test it for yourself because everyone uses memory and I.O. in a different way. I'm doing it on, Amazon, uh, on an Amazon EC2 machine, uh, which is of the shape a C5 large. And I've got these weird numbers uh, here. Uh, oh, you don't see my pointer. I've got these numbers there, uh, which says C5 large VM, uh, 20,000, 4,000 IOPS. The first number is the bursting number, and the second number is the base number. And that's also for the megabytes per second. How does that work? If you have a small machine, then in a lot of cases you're allowed to run with bigger limits for a small amount of time and then, and that is specified in the documentation how much, it will reduce it, which is called bursting. If you're using a virtual machine professionally, you should not use bursting. It can absolutely drive you nuts if you're doing something at a good rate and then for reasons unknown because the Amazon platform reduces this, so you can't see it. Linux doesn't give any indication. It just magically gets lower if you're bursting limits, you're bursting credits, I should say. It, in Amazon, it works based on the credit system, goes lower. Do not use it because it is impossible to understand without looking at the Amazon site and understanding that you've gone through your credits. And the same applies to the, um, what I call EBS, el elastic black block storage, there the limits are, uh, these have limits too. So you have to combine these limits and obviously the lowest of the two is what is applied. In my tests, I'm not running into my bursting limits, so then the lowest to apply, so I can do uh, 3000 IOs per second and 125 megabytes per second. These are my actually limits. There is a page, I, if you know, even if you know what you're looking for, it's I think it's hard to find that page, but it's really important to understand the limit. So you can use this link to see your EC2 limits, especially if you see weird things. And now when I say this, you think, hey, maybe that's it. So I have a, um, a C5 large, it's a four gig machine. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use FIO and I'm reading two gigabytes in this way. The switches are all there. A word about FIO. FIO is a brilliant tool. It, you can do anything with FIO. But in its brilliance, it has so many options, and so many options have been totally thought through that it sometimes is really strict in what it's doing, which means that it might not actually be doing what you think it's doing. And one of the things which, um, which are, uh, for which this is true is, I have a switch which you might not have seen a lot, which is a dash dash invalidate zero. Dash dash invalidate zero means to not wipe the cache before running it, because I want to run it two times and I want to show the advantages of using the cache. So it would not be helpful if FIO would wipe the cache for the second one, because then I would be doing exactly the same, right? If you're doing things with FIO, validate, cross-check that what it, that FIO actually does what you think it is doing. It's really important to do that. I find that I want to look into specific uh, behavior. It might not do what I, th what I am thinking it is doing. So this is how it looks like. And I hope uh, it's a video. So I hope it's big enough and I, yeah, it is doing stuff. This is a utility and I'm, Afraid, yeah, I cannot enlarge it because it's a video. So this is, uh, I is wrote a small utility in Rust to show the memory sizes and what the, and I will show the end output in a bigger font later on. So essentially I'm running stuff. So I'm looking into this and then I'm um, pasting FIO and by pasting FIO it will uh, start 
reading, uh, start reading data. And then it produces the output. And this is the highlight. I'm doing uh, 2609 IOs per second, which is 21 megabytes per second. My limits are higher. So why can I not reach the limits here? Is, is Amazon lying about its limits? No. It's the latency. The latency is really good. It's 0 0.3 um, milliseconds per I.O. But still, I need to do them. And I, these are all sequential. And I'm reading it for the first time in, in my case. So I'm still bound by the latency, despite the fact that my latency is really low. So this is, this is really great, but still, I'm bound by the latency by doing I.O. I do not hit the limits of the device. Now, if I perform the exact same run again, well, this is how, how am I doing it, but it returned immediately. And these are the figures. My I.O.s per second now doing it a second time with the dash dash invalidate zero switch, so I actually can take advantage of my cache. I'm doing 580,000 IOs per second at a rate of 4.5 gigabytes per second. I promised you it can have magical results. I think these are magical results. The first time was okay. Well, actually really good for doing physical IO. And the second one is marvelous. This is what you want to see. The reason for it, well, kind of obvious. I haven't done any physical I.O. actually at all. And FIO does show this with the I.O.s um, line. It didn't do any physical I.O. I, it just read it from memory. Now, oh. now, how about 4 gigs? And mind you, my system is 4 gigs in size, uh, approximately. So I'm doing the exact same thing. The only thing I changed is setting it to 4 gig. Well, I'm looking at the same stats again. So a summary of the run is this first run is actually like the other first run. I'm bound by the latency of doing the IOs, which are really fast, but still you need to read it. So I'm bound by the latency. So the rate is identical to the 2 gig. Now let's perform the exact same run again. Look at the option dash dash no random map. FIO is really smart. At first I try doing it uh, and running it again, but because FIO, if you're doing random IO, the IOs are truly randomized, but it keeps a map in memory and it very explicitly touches every single block truly only once, to truly only take each block once for reading it, which is not the random in my definition, because an application which would fire random IOs would touch some blocks multiple times. You can achieve that by setting the dash dash no random map flag. Again, what I said is FIO is so smart and well thought through that if you think, if you want certain behavior, please validate that it actually does what you think it is doing. So it is random, but only random in choosing the blocks, not random in choosing blocks multiple times. Um, I was very surprised to learn that. And if it does, if I don't do this and just touch every block once and I've got lesser memory than the file, it cannot keep it and it will actually push through all the IOs. So I will not have any caching effect at all. And that is more or less what is achieved in this run. I'm doing loads of IOs because the file I'm trying to read is bigger than memory, so I cannot cache the entire file. And just because I touch some blocks multiple times, I will get some caching effect. But the caching effect here is way less. Uh, it's, uh, I'm doing, um, I'm doing four, uh, 4,200 IOs per second, which is where I'm bound by. And that is because I simply touch some blocks multiple times, but most of them still need to be read. But the question is, I've now done some tests, but are these tests actual, actually reality? 
if you're most of the time if you're doing stuff with IO, you have an application which drives them. And this application likely will use the data you're trying to IO and will keep that in memory for the sake of running the application. So what if I do the same tests but occupy 50% of the memory? Well, this utility I wrote, which I actually borrowed from a C program from this uh, URL um, um, uh, and reprogrammed it in, in Rust, I take 50% of memory and I touch the memory so it's actually allocated and then by that take 50%, I map 50% of the memory so it's not available anymore and then redo the same tests. What is happening? This, I have no idea what happened. So this is running um, the utility. The first run is identical to the one with without memory taken because that just reads the IO uh, reads the blocks and the IO it's I'm bound by the latency and the latency doesn't change. So but I have uh, uh, um, so the it's generally equal. And if I do it again, because I have lesser memory in my server, I here now with two gig, I already have to add dash dash no random map. But if, if I'm doing it again, well, this is too small to be visible. Sorry about that. I cannot get the same figures as I had previously. Well, I think in this order, this is really obvious. But now think about a scenario where you have an application or a database, I think it's quite common to have a database in an application stack, you just start up the database, nothing is actually allocated, and you run a test, and the test can take advantage of the caching, and you say everything is good. Then, a year later, if or whatever the time of the uh, project is, and you're actually, the whole application is done, you hook up all your connections to the database and the database is actually being used and you're doing exactly the same and then the performance is totally different. This is what I tried showing here. And this is actually a real life situation which I've seen an enormous lot that people tested actually probably without realizing in an absolute good situation and then in reality when memory is actually taken and stuff is actually run, performance is drastically lower and nobody understands why it's low, because we tested it. Well, this is the reason you have to understand your memory footprint and your actual I.O. amount that you're doing. And you can see it here too. I'm doing the 2 gig, and Fio shows me that I've performed a lot of I.O.s. You see uh, I.O.s there at the bottom line. Now let's look at writes. Here I start too with an idle machine and I uh, write uh, something and this is a summary of the run. My IOPS per second, uh, for writes obviously I do not have to do two runs, R writes I just perform writes and it's done. For writes, uh, and writes are special. Uh, I just said it in the beginning, and why I write special? If you're writing in Linux, any buffered write is not done to disk. A lot of people think it's done to disk, it isn't. You're writing into memory, and then the kernel will decide at a certain point in time to write the blocks you've dirtied to disk. And that's a really interesting concept, and it's is not obvious uh, because you think, you know, normal human thinking is that if I'm writing, I'm writing to disk immediately. But that's not what is happening. Um, another thing, sorry, yes, there is. Uh, 
Yes, yes. I, uh, the, um, the remark is, even if you're writing, then the disk controller will cache it. Yes, absolutely. I do not want to go to that, down to that level because the amount of stuff in Linux is already uh, a lot. Writes are special. The first thing which is really special in Linux with writes, which you have to realize because then it becomes a lot more logical, is if you read something and then the memory is needed, this read can be discarded immediately. Nothing is harmed by discarding this block and it can be reused. If you're writing something and you've got this dirty block, the kernel has no other option than to write. It, cannot, it will not even put it to swap, a write to swap. It will write it to disk and it must do it because if it doesn't, then it will corrupt the file system. And that is why, what I meant with writes are special. Therefore, the limits for writes are way lower. Uh, take, um, the amount of writes that you can do are limited because you cannot swamp your memory with doing writes because then your system is stuck with dirty blocks. And you can probably write to memory faster than you can write to disk, right? That's the whole purpose of buffering them in the first place. So therefore, there are uh, kernel parameters uh, set which are VM dirty background, rate, uh, background ratio and VM dirty ratio. And here is a thing which is really not well documented and which uh, a lot of people think these ratios come from the total amount of memory. That is not true. I think it's even documented in that way. I'm not sure if it's in the kernel documentation, but there are a lot of blogs describing that these ratios are from total memory. These ratios are from available memory, which means that if you take an application and you start allocating memory, then the available memory obviously lowers because you've taken memory and use it for a certain purpose. So the available memory lowers automatically your uh, dirty background ratio and dirty ratio therefore also will lower. And that is really important to understand because that means that then a write which could be buffered in a certain way at one point in time, if your application is really hungry for memory and takes a lot of memory, then at another point in time, your threshold for needing to write these dirty pages might be way lower. And Actually, what the kernel does is if the kernel finds that you're swamping the memory with dirty pages based upon this ratio, if you're performing a write system call, the kernel in the write system call will evaluate the amount of dirty pages and just put asleep. It, this is really what it does. It calls balancing. It will put asleep in the write call and just put your process or thread in. Um, in, uh, in a sleep state, it will truly just schedule it off CPU for a certain amount of time in order to try to push back on the writes to try to balance it. And it's called actually uh, balancing. And I've got a link here too to a blog post where I wrote, an about, wrote about it, where I go to the exact lines in the kernel where this is happening. And the reason it's, it's actually good, even if you can't read C to, do, to go to that, um, to go to the kernel code because there is a lot of explanation about these ratios in the, in the, in the C code of the kernel for this. So I'm writing and I'm writing 500 megabytes. And this is the summary of it. Uh, I'm doing 500 megabytes on this system and I get really great figures. It's uh, 193,000 uh, IOs per second and 1.5 gig per second. And why am I getting these really good figures? Well, I've got a system which has no applications taken a lot of memory and therefore this write of 500 megabytes didn't actually produce any IOs whilst running it because I was below the limit. And that is what is on the lowest line is my available memory is three gig and the ratio makes my uh, make the ratio is set to 922 megabytes. So therefore, the 500 megabytes I'm trying to write fits in memory as dirty pages. Brilliant. Now let's look at reality too. And I think you can you understand what the reality stuff here is doing. If I take 50% of memory, then my available memory will lower, obviously, and therefore my 
uh, percentage of the limit will be lower. And therefore, if I produce the same write of 500 megabytes and do it again, in pretty much the same sense as my reads, now all of a sudden, this write will be way slower. And that's not because the system has magically gone slower. No, there is a very good explanation. We've taken a lot of memory. We have way less cache. And therefore, the kernel will do exactly the same. If you cross a certain threshold, it will determine that you're trying to flood the system with dirty pages. So therefore, it starts throttling your write calls in order to, uh, in order to, uh, to balance uh, the memory. And well, this is all doing that. And well, write two gig, I don't think I can add a lot if, if you know this and if you understand that his limit gets, uh, gets lower. It, with two gig, uh, the, the first run of two gig will already um, go over the limit. So with 50% taken, it will also go uh, over this limit. So what am I saying? If you have a system running in Kubernetes in a pod, which is probably has a certain amount of memory, and you rely on I.O. performance at a certain rate, do you, and, and you know you're doing buffered I.O., do you keep track of available memory? And do you understand whether what you're trying to do fits in with how your memory is sized? Do you know that? Because I don't know a lot of people who actually actively keeping track of available memory. Whilst if you're relying on performance, this should be the parameter to look at. Because that is what is most telling about what is available for it. And do you understand the amount of reads and writes that you're doing? And this is a really tricky one. And uh, in my past as a, an, an Oracle database administrator, I saw that a lot too. If you're doing a certain amount, if you're using a certain amount of pages now, it doesn't mean that you will be doing exactly the same if you're a few months or a year further. M probably, if you have a successful application, there's be, there'll be more users, there's more data, so you maybe are doing more IOs. So even if the application absolutely didn't change, if everything kept on being the same, you could still hit a limit simply because you're using more data and your memory amount is fixed. So therefore, you hit the threshold and therefore your fast IOs from cache cannot work anymore because you're requesting more IOs. Um, and it's important to understand the differences between reads and writes. Um, and this is active data set. That's what I just talked about. Do you understand how much data you're requesting all the time and do you know if it grows or not? Um, well, I said this at the beginning and this is actually my uh, last slide so then I'm, and I'm open for questions or any remarks in that sense. The tests I did were performed on a system with no swap device. That is how we do it and for simplicity and understanding where if you have a memory shortage that is I was kind of surprised, but it's actually refreshing because you do not have to swap. Because I see swap as kind of a cushion for falling. If you have too little memory, you have a problem, period. Or your performance is influenced. Let me put it more friendly. Your performance will be influenced. If you do not have swap, you will hit kind of a wall because you know your memory is limited. If you have swap, you are you will be hitting the wall too. No question about that. You know, if you're running out of memory, you're, you're running out of memory. Period. But you have this cushion that it is a little less painful within certain limits. Uh, so I'm not advocating totally against swap, but I'm also not advocating for having it all the time. You have to think about it whether it makes sense and if you want the complication, especially if performance is critical. So, uh, well, and then the last remark is um, Linux ages buffers based upon an R LRU mechanism, least recently used. So if things swap out, 
it's pr it's not used in a long time. I can guarantee that. Well, it's based upon the uh, LRU state of all the pages, obviously, but it isn't used in a long time. So if you swap out some stuff, it might not really be... Well, it means you demanding memory, which you don't have. So that is the reason why it would swap in the first place. But it's not really a problem if you have some swap being in use because the Linux kernel will try to do as little as possible. So if it's swapped out pages and you're not requesting them, they will be sitting there swapped out as long as the application from which they came from is still active. And it's not a problem. A lot of people think it's a problem. It's not a problem. So that is the end of my presentation. So hopefully um, you've enjoyed it and it gave you a lot of thoughts. I, I, I will repeat the question. So the right throttling that you found, is that kernel imposes linear speed for it, so does your backup speed also have a speed limitation? Um, the question is, how does the right throttling work? I think that is a really short version. Um, the right throttling works um, um, essentially it just tries to add time to have the uh, to prevent uh, the system from uh, getting swamped with pages like like I explained so it will do a, a little and I think it will go up to two seconds or something like that but you have to read the source code if you go to the link you can you can see it it's really interesting there is a perf um, you can set a perf probe on the kernel um, uh, on how is it called? It, it's called a probe, um, uh, but on the on the kernel function which executes this, which will then tell you whether it did the throttling and for how long. So that is how you can see it. But there is no uh, that is a really weird. Well, for for my mind, Oracle is really well instrumented. There is no other indicator that this is happening, and that is the reason why it was kind of surprising to me that this is happening in the first place because there is no statistic that will tell you it happened. Um, I will get, with I think. Th uh, yes, what, well, the waiting which happens in, in the right call is actually the Linux schedule, um, the Linux scheduling you off CPU for a certain amount of time. Uh, no, that is. Uh, sorry, no, sorry. IOSTAT shows the block device statistics, so that has nothing to do with that. IOSTAT will show you how it communicated with the disks, not how the process performed a write. Okay. So yeah, it's 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 really close, but it's it's really two different layers. Prox, uh, so the Linux kernel has statistics, and that's proc. Oh, PSI. Yeah, PSI, and there's memory and I/O, and there's memory and I/O and memory and I/O. So the question is: uh, the Linux kernel has uh, PSI, pressure stall info. Uh, uh, and does pressure stall info give more or more useful information than proc mem info? I think they serve two different purposes. Um, proc mem info gives you a lot of details, but it really doesn't tell you anything about performance. And pressure stall information is all about if I'm executing I/O, what is the impact on running? Because that is what I think the the stall information is is showing you. So in my mind they show you two different sides of, of doing I.O. Or, well, actually, proc mem info doesn't say anything about I.O., just how memory is divided between uh, all the pages in, in a lot of details. 
and PSI will tell you that, but I haven't looked too deeply at PSI because it is a fairly recent um, uh, feature. There hasn't been a lot, well, there is enough blog posts about it, but not an overly lot. And I haven't seen a lot of people actually using it. That is what I've seen, which is a shame because I think it's really interesting. And if you have the opportunity to enable it, I would certainly do it to see if you can make sense of it because it, it gives you actually information based upon the perspective of ru the process running the I.O. instead of just figures for an amount of I.O.s that you're doing. So it's, it's a really good uh, thing to mention, but I haven't got a lot of experience, sadly. Okay, um, I, I think I understand your question. Your question is, okay, you've talked about it, but what should I do now with this information? No, it... Um, so th the question is, well, I think this question still, <laughs> still is, okay, you've told me a lot of details about how this works, but what should I do? What can I do with it in a practical way? Well, a lot of these details would mean... Yeah. Well, I have a question that's kind of like that. Works now. So, the, so you talked about the examples with 50%. So does the... So does the swapper process get uh, running at, at the point of the, the, both of those examples, the read and write, when you, when you don't have a swap available, swap file or whatever you use to swap space? So could, could you see that process running at those times? Um, I try, so your question is, if the problem happens, what can I see at that? What, what I was going to say, which I think, like, like you said, is, is quite closely re related to your question, is what can you do? Well, if you want to get down to the bottom of it, it will cost you time and you need to build up some experience. And probably if you have a whole farm of service, you, can, you do not have this time. Well, gather stat get a lot of the details and just get them. You know, uh, uh, Prometheus will get them for you. So you can research and go back to these details in time, because that is a thing which Linux doesn't provide to you, but with, for example, Prometheus or with a lot of other tools, you can get the statistics back in time, so you can figure it out if you're running into a problem. One of the things which I think is really important to understand is you need free memory if you have an application doing I.O., doing buffered I.O., you need free memory which for the perspective of someone who is uh, trying to size a system is memory not doing anything, you need free memory for the sake of this caching. And this is what I see being left out all the time. People would carefully size up saying, I have an application which takes so much uh, memory and I take so much for the operating system, so this is the amount of memory I need. And what I'm telling you is, if you're actually using that memory, then there is nothing left for performing this buffering. So then your I.O. will fluctuate all the time. It will be good one time and then be absolutely crap the second time. And it's kind of um, hard to figure out why. Um, Um, yeah, well, the first realization is you have to understand that you have to, to size extra memory, which from the perspective of uh, sizing memory is, is that memory, memory doing nothing, but you actually need it. Exactly. <clears throat> we have time for one more question. And over here was... Oh, sorry. I saw a hand raised over here. So you, you've switched between two things. One, in my mind, is that uh, 
you have an Oracle database that pretty much owns the machine in certain cases. And then it, but then you also talk about Kubernetes, where my pod that is doing uh, read and writes is fighting with other pods that are all using the combined resources and machine. So my pod, though it could be uh, uh, memory limited, the, the caching and the read-write layer is really being shared by all the other pods. So how do I determine what my pod needs because I don't know what the other pod owners are doing with their pods as well. So once again, I understand that if you had an application that owned the box, you can make these calculations. But once you say Kubernetes pod, you're fighting with other people. That's a very good remark. And this is something which I generally find lacking in a lot of talk about Kubernetes, because indeed you have a single physical box and you run multiple pods, multiple machines, which do not see each other, which try to use these shared resources, which they all share in the same machine. And I think this is a very big under uh, um, an aspect of running Kubernetes, which is greatly underappreciated on looking into because what should be there, in, but that is an opinion, I'm not saying it, it should, but simplistically thinking, if you're having resources and you know the amount of resources, you should divide them and just say, okay, well, for CPU, I know you can do that. You can already divide, so you have a fixed amount of uh, CPU. Memory is also divided per pod, as, as, far, as, I, uh, as far as I know. So you, you can do that, figure out if you have enough memory. But then, indeed, your physical I.O. devices are shared. And, and actually, in my opinion, your physical I.O. should also be um, fixed per pod so that you can carefully cut out, say, I've got 3,000 I.O.s, and especially in the, in, in the cloud and with a lot of other machines, you, you know your amount of I.O.s uh, per second that you have and, and the bandwidth that you have and say, I want 20% of this uh, I.O. to be dedicated to this specific pod, which is running here. So this is a resource which needs to be there if this pod is running on this physical machine. But that is an opinion I have because, and it's, it's not that I want it. The point is, if you don't do that, then exactly what you say, and again, this is what I see as a big problem, your usage and your uh, latency will come across as very random because at one point in time you can do a certain amount of IOs and 20 minutes later you can't do it because you have a few other pods who, take, who also try to share the same resource and therefore you get a lower amount. And this is a big problem if you try to do quality of service and say, I want to make sure that it's running at a certain rate. Absolutely. I think that is a missing part. So, yep. I've, wholeheartedly agree with what you what you see and absolutely true. 